Now at 9, new DNA evidence links a nearly 40-year-old California cold case to Lamar, Missouri. Plus, the city of Lamar is digging a new water well. I'll be talking to city officials to find out why when they already have one. I'm Anthony Saviello. More coming up. And the unique way the Parsons School District is trying to encourage people to become bus drivers. The four states most watched news starts now. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. President Biden tonight held a solo news conference for the first time since last November. Though the conference came at the end of the 2024 NATO summit. Many of the questions the president faced were in regard to his campaign. He pushed back at every suggestion he was slowing down or showing noticeable signs of decline or that he was not in command of the job. We'll have more on the conference later in the newscast. Well, the victim in an unsolved California murder from 1985 is now linked to Lamar, Missouri. Authorities have released this sketch of an unidentified woman whose skeletal remains were discovered in Newark, California in 1985. They say she had been shot and killed up to a year before. And she was between the ages of 25 and 36, was five foot six to five foot eight inches tall and had brown, red or auburn hair. And now DNA testing shows the victim was a descendant of a former Lamar, Missouri resident, Mary Ann Marie Helms Thorburn Richardson, who was born in Lamar in 1932. Now Richardson is now deceased. Investigators say it's likely the victim was placed for adoption as an infant, possibly in the late 1940s. Investigators want to hear from anyone who has information about the adoption or the victim's identity. And you can find much more about this case on KOAMnewsnow.com. The city of Lamar has begun drilling a second water well to help improve the town's water quality. KOAM's Anthony Saviello has more. Going to well provides several benefits. One's water quality, two is water flavor should improve, but also it lowers our treatment cost. It lowers the chemicals we have to put in to treat the water, lowering that cost and improving the water itself. This well being drilled in Lamar is a part of a bigger $3 million project. This is coming through state and federal funding uh, through the ARPA program. So the city's portion is about $600,000 whenever you look at both projects together. Um, we're also replacing water lines with this project. So, but we still think it's going to be a positive effect for our citizens. This secondary well will allow the current redundant water source of Lamar City Lake to no longer be necessary. We have to have a redundant water source to make sure we can provide our customers and our residents. Um, currently, we still are connected to the city lake and our goal is to move away from the lake and provide only well water. This drill uses air compression to dig into the ground. It is currently drilling at 50 feet an hour. The foam substance being ejected from the machine is what is used to bring the broken rock and dirt to the surface. Once it is all said and done, this well will be 1,200 feet deep. For reference, that's nearly the same height as the Empire State Building. Reporting in Lamar, Missouri, Anthony Saviello, KOAM News. For residents who may be concerned about the water quality, the city does an annual quality report, which you can find on our website at koamnewsnow.com. Parsons, Kansas School District is in need of school bus drivers, so they held a sort of tryout. Interested residents were able to come out and give driving a bus a shot in a safe, controlled environment. Officials say this is a way to help remove some of the fear and intimidation that may keep people from applying to become a bus driver. It's a nationwide issue. Uh, there's a bus driver shortage in the nation. Uh, Parsons is no different. So we're just trying to recruit people and try to uh, create some interest in uh, uh, people being able to drive a bus and, and help us out here at the school district. One of my favorite one is when I... Well, the district is looking for part-time drivers at the moment. Well, you can now visit the Web City Farmers Market on Thursdays. For the next three Thursdays, the market is open from 4 to 7 p.m. It has more than fresh produce, too. The market also offers board games, free kids' meals, and an opportunity for kids to dig into some fun on the kids' garden. 
And for a $35 fee, you can also learn the art of flower arranging. Thursday hours run only through August 1st, but the market is open every Tuesday from 4 to 7 p.m. through October 15th, and it's open every Saturday morning year-round. A Southwest Missouri school now has a wheelchair accessible garden thanks to a donation of supplies and labor. The Oakview State School in Monette, Missouri serves students with severe disabilities. The Lowe's store there provided the materials and Lowe's employees assembled the garden on the campus this week. Well, fair season in the four states continues as the Jasper County Youth Fair gets into full swing in Carthage, Missouri. Morning kicked off with a market steer show. Young exhibitors will also get a chance to show off their sheep and pigs. And for one exhibitor, showing animals came from her siblings. My siblings actually, all my siblings did cows and I was always the one, the one that ran around doing all the things for them. And I was like, well, I want to do it and you guys can run around for me. Well, now they're too old to run around, so I run around for myself. <laughs> That's the way it works out. If you're interested in checking out the Jasper County Youth Fair, there's still time. The event runs through Saturday. Well, coming up, lowering your risk factors. A new study is out showing how making positive lifestyle changes can affect our risk for cancer. I'm Jonathan Sari in Atlanta. I'll have details coming up. A new study is out looking at how we can decrease our risk for cancer by changing unhealthy habits. Fox News correspondent Jonathan Suri has the details. About half of cancers have something that causes them that we can do something about today. The American Cancer Society releasing a new study giving insight into cancer diagnoses and deaths that can be attributed to behaviors we can change. The study finding that four in every 10 cancer cases in the U.S. and about one half of all cancer deaths in adults over the age of 30 can be attributed to modifiable risk factors. These include smoking, alcohol consumption, inactivity, activity and excess body weight. We know there's at least 13 different cancers that have some association with being at an unhealthy weight. Our body makes different hormones from those uh, fat cells when we have more of them and that those hormones can serve as the fuel for cancer to grow. With summer in full swing, Americans are also reminded of the risks of sun exposure as skin cancer is the most commonly diagnosed in the country. People oftentimes think, oh, sunburn's not a big deal. But in fact, a sunburn is the beginning of damage to the skin that over time can actually turn into a skin cancer. Dr. Kamal also pointing to these risk factors when it comes to the increasing number of people under the age of 50 being diagnosed with cancer. There are a lot of people that are not following recommendations related to eating fruits and vegetables, reducing red meat, being active, staying out of the sun. There are small changes we can make every day that will reduce our risk of cancer. The leading risk factor remains smoking, which contributes to nearly 20% of all cancer cases. In Atlanta, Jonathan Siri, Fox News. Scientists at Northwestern University say for the first time they've discovered a possible cause of lupus. Researchers identified a molecular defect that impacts the body's immune system. They believe it could lead to targeted treatments. Lupus affects more than one and a half million people in the U.S. and can damage organs like the kidneys, brain, and heart. Touchscreen devices like tablets may be detrimental to toddler development. And that's the conclusion of a new study published in JAMA Network Open. Researchers found tablet usage was associated with decreased attention and responsiveness while playing with physical toys was associated with better language skills. They say tablets can constrain play for toddlers in a way that real toys do not. Well, Doug is next with a complete look at your forecast. And later, a Webb City High School basketball standout makes her commitment to play at the collegiate level. Well, of course, a hot one for us today. Temperatures uh, lower 90s during the afternoon. And then through the evening hours, we've had scattered thunderstorms, especially in our northern counties. Those have kind of fizzled apart a little bit over the past hour or so, and then they're going to flare back up later on tonight. Looking outside, nice shot. Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam, of course. This is downtown Joplin, so we're looking off toward the north and to the east. Pretty quiet out there right now. All right, so it's Thursday. 
Every Thursday we get our drought trackers updated so you can still see a pretty good drought. Oklahoma City, Wichita points west, but if we zoom into our area, not too bad. Most of us are looking pretty good. It's dry southern Jasper County through Newton County and then also into Barry County. So we want to watch that as we get a little bit deeper into the summer months. Temperatures still most of us sitting low to mid 80s. We're going to slowly drop back as we go through the overnight eight hours. 84 southerly winds at about 5 to 10 for us right now. But our humidity has come up just a little bit. Dew points now sitting 65 upwards to about 70 degrees. So that puts us into that sticky to muggy range. And that's where we're going to be sitting as we go through the next couple days. All right, thunderstorms, northern counties, but you can see they've kind of fizzled apart over the past couple hours. So we just have the tops of the thunderstorms kind of blowing off uh, Yates Center, Iola, Chanute. Besides that, we are looking pretty good, but these are going to flare back up a little bit later on tonight. But still, a few little sprinkles, Yates Center, Iola, over toward Chanute. And then we had a few showers over toward Nevada, but those have also fallen apart over the past hour or so. But here's what's going on. Weak little wave, still northerly flow. If we go out toward the west, big dome of high pressure is building. And with that big dome of high pressure, as it builds in, that is going to allow the heat to get worse as we go into the weekend and also early next week. All right, let me take you through time. Here's after midnight, scattered thunderstorms flaring back up. Kansas into Oklahoma, kind of pushing east, hit and miss storms. But if you get stuck underneath one of these, it's going to rain pretty good. Here's 530 in the morning, starting with some scattered thunderstorms in the morning. And then we clear out hot, humid, mid 90s once again for highs. Then we do it again. Tomorrow night, scattered showers and thunderstorms popping up into Saturday morning. So we'll have scattered storms to start the day on Saturday. And then these will fizzle apart. And then once we get into the afternoon, hot, humid, once again, heat indices are going to be up there as well. All right, Friday day planner 72 to start 88 by noon. High temp 94 degrees and with those heat indices or the humidity, it's going to feel like near 100 to about 105 across the region tomorrow and then 100 to 105 as well. Once we get into Saturday afternoon, 94 on your Friday, 96 Saturday, 99 on Sunday, triple digit heat moving in on Monday and Tuesday. Tanya. Well, a group of 16 cyclists are on a mission to travel across the country, starting in Yorktown, Virginia, headed to San Francisco. It's all with the goal of raising awareness and understanding about multiple sclerosis. And today they stopped in Pittsburgh and that's where KOAM photojournalist Ty Parks caught up with them. You really get to see America for yourself uh, rather than just hearing about it from um, rumors or stereotypes or anything like that. So you get the hands on authentic experience. Uh, great exercise. Certainly you have a community you're working with, uh, the friends on the team, and then also helping people with MS, which is sort of like a greater, bigger picture of everything. As some people have said, you can't prepare for this. Like it's on the job bicycle training, so to speak, because we start in Yorktown, Virginia, and I think within four days we're going over uh, the Appalachian Mountains, uh, and now we just got out of the Ozarks. So it's it's a tough, tough thing, um, but you try to you know bike as much as you can. Uh, just getting your saddle right is the easiest way to say it. But like your muscles, they're they're gonna hurt the first week no matter what. But you'll be in incredible shape as the trip goes on and just getting stronger and better and hopefully enjoying the biking more as it goes on. As a cyclist loved Kansas because it was like so flat, there wasn't anything on the horizon to distract you except, you know, like the water tower every 20, 30 miles. So you just get into like an absolute groove and your mind is, is going to go where it's going to go and you don't have to worry about turns. And so biking, I really loved Kansas, but you have like the woods of Kentucky and Virginia, uh, the flatlands of Kansas, then you got the Rockies, Utah's its own experience, and Nevada is wild too. And then uh, I grew up outside of San Francisco, so finishing the trip in San Francisco was a wonderful homecoming for me. Yeah, so each person on the team has a minimum fundraiser of about like a little under $6,000 so they can get family together, friends. Um, some people do like auctions, people can do bake sales, but they just people who believe in them and believe in the cause. And we've had two people on the trip uh, who I think have raised over $13,000 each. And we try to fund, like earlier in the trip we went to, 
uh, the MSAV, which is like a small uh, rural community center in Virginia and supported their work. And tomorrow in Pittsburgh, we're helping like a few people with MS just do work around the house. So we try to help individuals and bigger organizations with MS with the fundraising. Well, the group plans to move out of Pittsburgh on Saturday, and since its inception, the group has raised $3.3 million for MS research. Well, coming up, getting bad advice. Is social media hurting your kids' future wealth? I'm Eben Brown in Miami. I'll have that story straight ahead. Redbox is no more. The DVD kiosk rental business is shutting down after its parent company converted its bankruptcy to Chapter 7 liquidation. Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment, which owns Redbox, was nearly $1 billion in debt and owes millions of dollars to several entertainment companies. Variety reports the company's 1,000 employees are losing their jobs without any severance or extended benefits. Target is shelving a payment option. The retailer will no longer accept personal checks starting July 15th, and they will continue to accept other already accepted payment methods. Aldi and Whole Foods also do not take checks as a form of payment. Financial software solutions company Abrigo says about 61% of Americans are still writing checks. A new study by Bank of America shows young investors are moving away from traditional markets and into alternatives like crypto. Fox's Evan Brown has more. Parents and grandparents historically have urged their kids and grandkids to save up and maybe invest. It's never too early to start talking to kids about wealth. But unlike baby boomers and Gen Xers, younger people aren't so quick to buy the advice of financial planners or investment advisors, opting to stay away from old-fashioned stocks and bonds and sink their money into cryptocurrency and digital assets. And the how-to is often just a screen tap away. Today. As soon as kids can Google, they can start to figure out information about a family, about their wealth, about the assets that they have. So the sooner that we start engaging them and educating them in the conversation, I think the better off we are. A new survey from Bank of America Private Bank reveals 72 percent of young investors don't think stocks or bonds will deliver the returns they want. So they're investing in alternatives with online misinformation, often replacing expert advice when it comes to wealth management. More than half aren't even engaged in estate planning, suggesting those investors aren't adopting time-tested best practices for managing their wealth because they can't find it on all the fun apps. Young individuals in general tend to pick up bul the bulk of their news from social media. So some of that is tried and true and tested and very informed, and some of that's just trendy. And Bank of America estimates about $84 trillion will be changing hands over the next few decades as baby boomers pass on their wealth to their children. In Miami, Eben Brown, Fox News. Well, the White House is handing out $1.7 billion to juice electric vehicles in America. Funding will help convert closed down or at risk auto manufacturing and assembly plants to make electric and hybrid vehicles. The awardees include major automakers like GM and Volvo, as well as suppliers like American Auto Parts. The Biden administration says these projects will create 2,900 new jobs and save 15,000 jobs that may have been eliminated. Up next, a new survey shows the way most Americans damage their furniture and who most often gets the blame. A new survey says Americans have a hard time taking care of their furniture. The Allstate Protection Plan survey says nearly 175 million Americans have damaged a piece of their furniture. And 61% of accidents happen within two years of owning it. About 40% of respondents say sofas, couches, and love seats were the pieces they got most recently stained or banged up. Red wine stains and takeout food, messing them up during binge TV watching were the bad culprits. But who gets the finger pointing? 45% blame their spouses and 34% Blame their kids. It's my kids all the way. 30 more minutes of news, weather, and sports coming your way. How the Galesburg, Kansas Fire Department is using a grant from Nutella.
Plus, President Biden looks to regain support in a high-stakes solo news conference. You're watching the four states most watched news. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. The Galesburg, Kansas Fire Department will get some upgraded fire protection equipment thanks to a $5,000 grant from the Nutella Company. KOAM's Melissa Alexis has more. And all of this hose back here is hose that will be replaced. As a firefighter, your gear is one of the most important parts of doing your job. But like many rural volunteer fire departments, this Galesburg, Kansas fire department has not had access to updated equipment. It was a little disheartening um, when I got here last year. Um, our average age of fire apparatus was 42 years old. John Lilberg, the fire chief, says that the National Fire Protection Association recommends that fire hoses be replaced every 20 years. But some of the hoses at his station have been there as far back as the 70s and 80s. The fire hose that, that we're using this grant to replace was from 1947, um, almost as old as me. Recently, things are looking up for their department as they've been offered a $5,000 grant from Nutella, a hazelnut spread brand. He says it's a big help considering their insufficient budget. It's a godsend. Um, we operate on less than $20,000 a year. They're using the grant money to replace their outdated hoses and hopes to continue updating the equipment little by little in the future through other grants. Next on his list, he hopes to replace two old trucks. It takes a huge weight off my shoulders um, that we'll have some, some safer equipment for them to operate with. The chief is looking forward to being able to serve the community in a more efficient way and growing their department by recruiting more volunteers. Reporting in Galesburg, Melissa Alexis, KOAM News. Well, the fire chief says his work is not done yet. He's still working to upgrade the department and has submitted a new grant request to completely remodel the fire station. Well, firefighters in Miami hosted a fire safety class for local kids. The fire department brought trucks, firefighters, and a fire pup to the public library for the event called Adventuring into fire safety. And the kids got another surprise when the Bureau of Indian Affairs wildfire team showed up with their own equipment and Smokey Bear. You know, talking to kids about this, um, promoting this event, there are so many kids that have no idea um, really about wildfires, uh, wildfire safety, that kind of thing. Nobody knows who Smokey Bear is anymore, that kind of thing. So I'm really excited to, to teach kids about this today. Well, the Miami Public Library's next event will be a summer Lego League, and that's next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Well, after weeks of questions over President Biden's fitness to run again, the president took his case to the media and the American people tonight, holding a rare solo news conference on the heels of this week's NATO summit. Fox News correspondent Rebecca Castor has the latest from Washington. Despite the frenzy over his mental fitness and criticism over last month's debate, President Biden made it clear he's determined to run for another term. That I think I'm the most qualified person to run for president. In his first unscripted news conference in nearly eight months, President Biden worked to calm concerns about his age and finally put to rest mounting questions about his mental fitness. We got more to do though, we got to finish the job. Ever since the president stumbled in his debate with former President Trump last month, debate is stirred over the 81-year-old's candidacy and his ability to beat Trump. I just got to just pace myself a little more. Pace myself. And the next debate, I'm not going to be traveling in the 15 time zones a week before. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's what it was about. Not helping matters, the president's numerous slip-ups, including this evening, mixing up Trump and his vice president. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president, but I think she was not qualified to be president. So let's start there. Earlier, Mr. Biden mistakenly called Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky Putin. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin. Still, Biden says he is the best candidate for the job. I'm not in this for my legacy. If I slow down, I can't get the job done. A new national poll shows more than half of Democrats say Biden should end his candidacy. But in a head-to-head -head matchup, Biden and Trump are still in a dead heat. 
in Washington, Rebecca Castor, Fox News. A bit later, after more than two years of war, we'll learn how this year's Olympics are taking on a whole new meaning for Ukrainian athletes. Well, of course, a hot one for us today. Temperatures uh, lower 90s during the afternoon. Then through the evening hours, we've had scattered thunderstorms, especially in our northern counties. Those have kind of fizzled apart a little bit over the past hour or so, and then they're going to flare back up later on tonight. Looking outside, nice shot. Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam, of course. This is downtown Joplin, so we're looking off toward the north and to the east. Pretty quiet out there right now. All right, so it's Thursday. Every Thursday we get our drought trackers updated so you can still see a pretty good drought. Oklahoma City, Wichita points west, but if we zoom into our area, not too bad. Most of us are looking pretty good. It's dry southern Jasper County through Newton County and then also into Barry County. So we want to watch that as we get a little bit deeper into the summer months. Temperatures still most of us sitting low to mid 80s. We're going to slowly drop back. As we go through the overnight eight hours, 84 southerly winds at about 5 to 10 for us right now. But our humidity has come up just a little bit. Dew points now sitting 65 upwards to about 70 degrees. So that puts us into that sticky to muggy range. And that's where we're going to be sitting as we go through the next couple days. All right, thunderstorms, northern counties, but you can see they've kind of fizzled apart over the past couple hours. So we just have the tops of the thunderstorms kind of blowing off. Uh, Yates Center, Iola, Chanute. Besides that, we are looking pretty good, but these are going to flare back up a little bit later on tonight, but still a few little sprinkles. Yates Center, Iola over toward Chanute, and then we had a few showers over toward Nevada, but those have also fallen apart over the past hour or so. But here's what's going on. Weak little wave, still northerly flow. If we go out toward the west, big dome of high pressure is building, and with that big dome of high pressure, as it builds in, that is going to allow the heat to get worse as we go into the weekend and also early next week. All right, let me take you through time. Here's after midnight, scattered thunderstorms flaring back up. Kansas into Oklahoma, kind of pushing east, hit mist storms. But if you get stuck underneath one of these, it's going to rain pretty good. Here's 530 in the morning, starting with some scattered thunderstorms in the morning. And then we clear out hot, humid, mid 90s once again for highs. Then we do it again. Tomorrow night, scattered showers and thunderstorms popping up into Saturday morning. So we'll have scattered storms to start the day on Saturday, and then these will fizzle apart. And then once we get into the afternoon, hot, humid, once again, heat indices are going to be up there as well. All right, Friday day planner 72 to start 88 by noon, high temp 94 degrees. And with those heat indices or the humidity, it's going to feel like near 100 to about 105 across the region tomorrow and then 100 to 105 as well once we get into Saturday afternoon. 94 on your Friday, 96 Saturday, 99 on Sunday. Triple digit heat moving in on Monday and Tuesday. Tanya. Thanks, Doug. Coming up in sports, a local Web City basketball player commits to a D1 program. Plus, Missouri Southern football hosts a prospect camp. Brock Baldridge will have that story and more up next. Missouri Southern football is still a month and a half away from kicking off the season. The Lions host hundreds of high school players to their annual prospect camp. Players who participate in the camp range from ages 8th grade to seniors in high school. The camp provides an opportunity for football players in the four states to be coached in front of a college coaching staff. MSSU head coach Atiba Bradley hopes that the kids participating in this year's camp can take home a valuable experience. We're all about, you know, if they can take one nugget back to their team to make them a better O lineman, D lineman, wide receiver, then we've done our job. You know, some of these guys, yeah, absolutely, we're recruiting, but primarily we're, we're, we're trying to give them something uh, that they can get better at over the summer. A lot of it is the same things their high school coaches are teaching, but you know how it is. Sometimes when a college coach says it, it's different. Uh, again, just fine tuning those fundamentals so they're ready for their seasons. Pitt State Soccer continues to work hard in their inaugural season as a program. This morning, the team announced the addition of eight new players set to join the PSU women's soccer program. 
So here's a look at the newest members of Pitt State Soccer. Four of the eight newcomers are transfers from junior college programs. Starting off the list with Macy Clements, Adriana Delgado, Dylan Ehe Gardner, Viana Gonzalez, Sailor Jensen, Abby Light, Carson Lynch, and Abby Williams. Second half, the second half of Pitt State's signing class all come for the transfer portal. The Gorillas will compete in their first exhibition match this August. A local high school girls basketball player announced on Wednesday night that she is headed to the next level. A 6'6 forward out of Webb City will continue her basketball career in the East Coast. Sammy Mancini out of Webb City announced on her social media platforms that she is committed to Providence women's basketball. Mancini spent her sophomore season with the Webb City Cardinals as she was selected as the 2023 first team all COC girls basketball team. Then Mancini spent her junior season with Link Academy girls basketball. She still has one more year of eligibility remaining in her high school career. Well, Indianapolis was picked to host the 2026 Final Four, but not only that, it will also host the 2026 Division II and Division III and NIT National Championship Games as part of its Final Four weekend. The Division II and Division III title games are scheduled for April 5th in 2026. It will be held at Gamebridge Fieldhouse, and that is the home of the NBA's Indiana Pacers. So how cool is that? You know, maybe Pittsburgh State or Missouri Southern, if they can make the national championship game in 2026, then maybe they could play at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. So that would be quite that, the experience if they were able to do that. That would be a fun fieldhouse to play in. Yeah, for and sure. That will also be good for the Division Three and the lower programs like that. So a lot of those kids may not get an opportunity to play somewhere like that. So to have that experience of playing those big arenas, I mean, anyone would take that. Um, back to the women's yeah. uh, soccer at PSU. How Do you know how many they're going to have on the roster? I don't have a, quite a few. Don't have the total number yet. I'm sure they're ma making their signing class. They're finishing things and finalizing things. So All it right. should be exciting to see. It'll be an exciting yeah. inaugural season for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. We're back with more news after this. The Summer Olympics opening ceremony kicks off July 26th in Paris, France. And while anticipation is growing, the pressure is especially on for athletes from Ukraine, with many saying this year's games are taking on a whole new importance. Fox News' Chris DeMeo has the story. With the Paris Summer Olympics just weeks away, athletes from around the world are continuing to train hard. But while going for gold is a goal, many Ukrainian athletes feel this Olympics is about more than gaining personal glory, citing how it's critical they raise awareness for their country as a Russian invasion intensifies. We compete to draw attention to Ukraine, to attract more media coverage, to keep raising the issue of the war. Preparing your body and mind for the Olympics is a challenge of its own, but with more than 500 Ukrainian sports facilities having been destroyed since the war began in 2022, athletes are facing extra hardships. You sit in the bomb shelter for an hour, then come out for 15 minutes, start warming up, moving, and then the siren goes off again, and you go back to the shelter. It's impossible to establish a normal training routine. Many male athletes are also torn by their decision to compete instead of fight. At first, you might wonder why many people, especially men, are defending the country while you're simply training. But then you realize that when you go out there, you're raising the Ukrainian flag. The war, meanwhile, is also impacting younger Ukrainians striving to take part in future Olympics. I want to become an Olympic champion. Oleksandra Pascal has been training in gymnastics since she was four years old. Now eight, she's pushing past an injury that resulted in her losing a leg after a Russian missile slammed into her home. Her coach says everyone is mustering the courage to press on. My primary task today is not to achieve high results in sports, but to preserve the mental and physical health of our children. Chris DeMeo, Fox News. We're coming up. We'll break down all the new movies headed to theaters and streaming services this week. Thrillers, romantic comedies, and more are new in theaters and streaming this week. Here's Fox's Ashley Devorkin. A space race set rom-com, a killer flick, and a Disney classic returns in this week's new releases. I work here now to sell the movie. Scarlett Johansson and Channing Tatum star in the romantic comedy Fly Me to the Moon. Set against NASA's historic Apollo 11 moon landing, Tatum plays the launch director and Johansson, a marketing guru, directed to stage a fake moon landing as a backup. 
the horror thriller Long Legs, which hit 100% on the Rotten Tomatoes tomato meter, follows an FBI agent uncovering supernatural clues as she races to stop a serial killer. Micah Monroe and Nicolas Cage star. Also in theaters is Touch, about a widower on a journey to find his first love who disappeared 50 years ago. Aren't you glad to see me? On streaming, Prime Video adds Tyler Perry's Divorce in the Black, which Perry directed, wrote, and produced. Megan Good and Corey Hardrick star in the story of a woman devastated by her divorce until his wicked deeds are revealed and she starts on a path to reclaim her life. Food is alive. Prime Video adds the movie turned series Sausage Party Foodtopia. Plus, in re-releases, The Lion King is back on the big screen for its 30th anniversary. The anniversary celebration continues in December with the release of the prequel movie Mufasa, The Lion King. In Hollywood, Ashley Dvorkin, Fox News. And that's our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll leave you with video of a baby pangolin at the Prague Zoo. Have a great night and an even better tomorrow.